Our planet is home to over 200 species of freshwater sponges, and they live on every continent except Antarctica. There are at least 31 species in North America. Sponges were originally thought to be plants, but they're actually animals. In fact, sponges are the simplest multicellular animals on the planet. The species seen here is what I believe to be Spongilla lacustris, and it's one of the most common freshwater sponges in both North America and Europe. It can grow as a tall branching structure like the form seen here, or it can grow as a low-profile, encrusting-type growth on top of or even underneath submerged rocks and logs. And while most freshwater sponges tend to be white or tan-colored, some species are green due to the presence of an algae that lives with the sponge. The algae and the sponge have what's known as a symbiotic relationship where both organisms benefit from their close association with each other. The sponge benefits by using some of the nutrients and oxygen created by the algae's ability to use the sun for photosynthesis, while the algae benefits by having a safe place to live and reproduce because very few things will eat sponges. Sponges are filter feeders, and they feed by pulling water into their pores using specialized cells that are lined with tiny hairs. The hairs beat rapidly and create a current that then pulls the water into the pores of the sponge so that it can feed on tiny food particles suspended in the water column. Sponges eat plankton, bacteria, viruses, and other forms of single-celled organisms. And there are even sponges in the ocean that are carnivores. And now it's time to travel to a different part of the lake that I like to call the cloud forest. Here, the sponges don't grow quite as tall and they're not quite as green, but there are more sponges here than in any other part of the lake. Freshwater sponges are hermaphrodites, so they can produce either sperm or eggs, but on any given sponge, they don't usually produce both at the same time, and this prevents self-fertilization and inbreeding. During sexual reproduction, sponges use a method known as synchronous spawning, and this is where a certain set of environmental cues triggers all of the sponges in a given area to release their sperm at approximately the same time. The sperm are then drawn in to other sponges in the area, and when a sperm meets an egg from the same species, they form a free-swimming larval sponge. The larval sponge will then drift through the water column like plankton before eventually settling down in a suitable location where the larva will then begin to grow and take on the form of an adult sponge. Synchronous spawning is the same method of reproduction used by corals in the ocean. Freshwater sponges, like the ones seen here, are thought to be triggered to spawn by seasonal changes in water temperature and available light. Sponges can also reproduce asexually by a process known as budding, and this occurs when an outgrowth of the sponge becomes detached from the parent and then settles down on the bottom of the lake where it then grows on its own into a separate sponge. But that's not the end of the story because freshwater sponges also produce what are known as gemmules. Gemmules are tiny reproductive spheres that are built to withstand cold temperatures and long periods without water. These gemmules can survive in harsh environments for many years until conditions in the habitat improve, at which point the gemmules are then triggered to start growing into a new sponge. Most of the freshwater sponges in my area produce gemmules in the fall just prior to the arrival of winter. These gemmules then settle on the bottom of the lake where they'll develop into adult sponges when conditions improve in the spring. 
By the way, the cloud-like appearance on the bottom of the lake is caused by a blanket of dead and dying filamentous algae that grows and then dies back each winter. The algae collects in this part of the lake because this is where the water leaves the lake by way of a small stream. So the gentle current in the lake and the prevailing winds from the west cause everything to flow in this direction. If you were to reach down and try to grab some of this dead algae, it would disappear between your fingers and you wouldn't feel a thing. I know because I've tried, and it's as if there's nothing there at all. It's like trying to grab a cloud or a blanket of fog. You can see it, but you can't hold it in your hands. So now, the question that must be in the minds of many of my viewers is, can freshwater sponges be kept in an aquarium? And the simple answer is, not for very long, at least not yet. But at some point in the near future, I think we'll figure out how to keep them alive indefinitely. They'll need very clean water, so keeping them with fish will be problematic because fish food and fish waste will make it harder to keep the water clean. And sponges are very difficult to feed because they're filter feeders, so you'll need to supply them with very small foods. If you put too much food in the water column, you run the risk of clogging the pores on the sponge and killing the entire colony. So there's a delicate balance of keeping the sponges fed while not clogging their pores or degrading the water quality by feeding them too much food. And the final factor to consider is that many freshwater sponges are adapted to a seasonal growth pattern where they die back periodically and then regrow when suitable conditions return. And allowing them to have this period of dormancy may be the key to keeping them in the long run. Despite the challenges of keeping freshwater sponges alive in the aquarium, many of us, including myself, would still like to try. And there are two options. You can buy them online or you can collect them in the wild. Sponges are available for purchase through retailers such as Carolina Biological Supply or Ward Science. However, both of these retailers take their sponges from the wild, and they both warn that even with the proper care, they don't live for very long in an aquarium. If you do plan on collecting sponges in the wild, please do so respectfully, and only when you've determined that there are enough of them to take one or two without putting the whole population in jeopardy. Large sponges can be broken into smaller pieces and then each piece can be grown as a separate colony. This is the same process used to propagate corals, and it's commonly known as fragging. And finally, it's important to mention that the drought-resistant gemmules from freshwater sponges can randomly find their way into your fish tank and suddenly begin to produce an adult sponge. These surprise appearances come as a result of the resilient nature of freshwater sponges, and it's a great example of just how perfectly designed these little animals really are. Thank you for taking this underwater journey with me to an incredible world that people rarely ever see to look at a beautiful creature that most people didn't even know was there. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.